Hey, real quick, I forgot this announcement. I actually had it in my hand. I just didn't, didn't, wasn't looking at it. Um, some of you guys might know uh, Laban Wingert. Um, he used to come to church here. He had a mini stroke, um, and he's in the hospital up in Chambersburg, so just remember to keep him in your prayers. Luke chapter 17, and we're going to start in verse 26. This morning, um, we're actually going to take a little bit of a detour from our study in 1 John. Um, what I want to talk about this morning, so this morning I've been thinking about actually for a couple of weeks and just feeling like the Lord's been pressing this on my heart. And, and uh, you know, I was, I was preparing for 1 John 3, starting in verse 4 and, and looking at that this morning. And um, he changed my mind really last night and just began to, to think about what I want to talk about and, and kind of put some things together. Um, but I want to start here with Luke 17. But before I do that, I want to ask you guys, and this is what we're going to talk about. Um, who is familiar with or who has been reading about or uh, seeing uh, what some out there are, are, are referencing, like these end time events um, in reference to these blood moons, um, the Shemitah, it's, you know, the, the end of the Jewish calendar, it's that seven year sabbatical, the seventh year being uh, the end of that happened September 13th. So there's folks out there that are saying some certain, certain things. And so has, has everybody, has anybody heard about any of this? The blood, like a show of hands, like I want to see. The reason I'm asking is because I've been asking folks outside the church, too. Uh, my my, my uh, routine usually on Sunday mornings is I get out of bed at 5.15 and I head to Hagerstown and I get my Dunkin' Donuts and, you know, I just clear my head and, and uh, you know, just think about uh, this morning. And, and so I know there's a couple in that Hagerstown area that thinks I'm probably crazy because I went up to them and, and uh, introduced myself and asked them that question. And uh, once they figured out I really wasn't super crazy, um, the question I asked him was, you know, have you, you know, there's, there's this talk going around about these blood moons and that uh, the last one in this cycle of these four blood moons occurs tonight. Um, and have you heard anything about that? Or have you heard anything about the Shemitah? It's, and, uh, especially the book that Jonathan Carr, if you're familiar with, you know, uh, he's a Messianic rabbi, uh, wrote a book called the Shemitah. Um, he also wrote one called the Harbingers. Um, just talks about God's judgment and connect, connections to certain things that's happened uh, specifically here in the United States, but around the world. And so I was talking to them about that and, and, uh, the one guy just tried to just, I think he's trying to justify his knowledge of any kind of religion. He's just like, well, my sister's a pastor. And I was like, I really didn't, didn't really answer my question, but, um, but at least he was receptive to what I had to say. And the girl was just like, she had, you know, she said, well, I've heard something about moons or moon or something. And, and she said, but to be honest with you, the last week I've basically been just uh, drinking beer and wine. Just to be honest with you, that's what she says to me. And then she says she was down at the Frederick Fair the whole time. And so she's kind of, that was the reason why she's not been in the know, because for this last week she's been drunk, basically. But... Um, so I said, okay. And, um, so as I'm thinking about this, and this is just a verse uh, that I want to start with. It just came to me this morning. It's not going to be on the slides, but I want to start with it. And I want to talk, and I'm not some expert on these blood moons. I've read a good bit about them and, and you know, about the, the Jewish um, holidays and the feasts that the Jews observe. That, and they are doing that right now. And, and uh, the, the Feast of Tabernacles or the Feast of Booth starts this evening and goes um, for a little bit. And so there's some things there. And so I want to give us uh, kind of an understanding of, of some of this at a very basic level. Like I said, I'm not an expert in it, uh, but I think it's important because I've talked to some people here in church about it. Or I've had questions asked to me. I've had questions asked to me outside the church about it. Um, there's conversation. You know, and this conversation has been going on for a while, actually, um, for, for so, several years as, as people are seeing uh, some things that are happening uh, in the world and they're connecting the dots, that, so they think, with some things. And so uh, what I want to do is just kind of briefly talk about them, give some just background about the blood moons, and this thing called the Shemitah, uh, this end of this cycle that the Jews observe, um, and then go into what I believe what the scriptures teach us about, you know, concerning these things and how our action should be, how our thoughts should be towards something uh, or towards those kind of things. So I want to start at Luke chapter 17 and verse 26, because when I spoke with these two people this morning, and they're not the only ones out there, um, th this verse came to mind. And Jesus here is talking uh, to the Pharisees, and the Pharisees ask him a question about the end. And he said, you know, when, when will the kingdom of God come? When will the end come, so to speak? So Jesus lays out a couple things to him, and then starting in verse 26 all the way down uh, to verse uh, 30, Jesus kind of gives the characteristic of people on the earth, what people are going to kind of be doing, what they're going to be engaged in. So as I'm thinking about these two folks, this is what came to mind this morning. So he says there in verse 26, and as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be also in the days of the Son of Man. They ate, they drank. They married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise, 
as it was also in the days of Lot, they ate, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built. Uh, but on the day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even so will it be in the day when the Son of Man is um, revealed. So let's pray, and then we're going to go into this study. Father, Lord, we thank you for your word, that in your word we have hope. Lord, we have confidence in you, Lord, as we spoke about last week, that we can have assurance before you, Lord Jesus, and we are abiding in that relationship with you, Lord. And as we hear all the ramblings and things uh, that are happening, uh, Lord, different ministries, different people saying things, uh, people talking about connecting stuff uh, to this date or that date and, and the events that, uh, that are actually going to happen, Lord, I pray that, uh, Lord, you would calm our hearts and that you would uh, just give us peace in knowing, Lord Jesus, that when we're in you, uh, that we have great hope. And Lord, I lift this uh, morning up before you, Lord, I ask you to speak to our hearts and speak through me, Lord, that, uh, that this would be clear this morning. And I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So what I want to look about, how, how many people here have a pretty under, good understanding of the blood moons? Has anybody been studying them or just kind of read about them? Just re yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's what they've been saying for a long time. <laughs> and we're going to look at that, the date setting folks. You know, there's a list of them. They've been doing it for a long time. And, and you know, I think sometimes, I don't know, I'm going to say God laughs from heaven, but, you know, when people start setting dates, I think he's just like, well, that's not going to be the day. <laughs> um, that's my, that's my opinion, <laughs> but whatever. So there are folks out there like that. So, I mean, uh, th there is stuff that, 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 that's being out there. I mean, and most of it is in and around Jonathan Carr's book, The Shemitah and the Harbingers, and talking about these things. There's another guy out there named Mark Biltz. Um, he's from El Shaddai Ministries. He's on TBN, and there's a lot of other ministries out there that are, you know, that are interviewing him, and he's connecting certain things and claiming that certain things are going to happen. Um, the, the, you know, the Bible is clear about the end times. Um, and that's what I want to look at this morning, you know, what is our response to that, and how, should, how we should be living, what we should be doing. But before we get into all that, I just kind of want to just briefly go down through them. And like I told you guys, I'm not an expert on these, these moons and, 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 uh, and some of the things that they're connecting. Obviously, the, there's, there's reality to uh, the Jewish festivals. They all point to Jesus, and that's really the point that we need to understand is that when we're, when we're in Christ, you know, we're keeping all those things. But um, I want to start out with Genesis chapter 1. Because there's, this is where Mark Biltz and Jonathan Carr and others uh, will, will start kind of with. Um, I actually had, I listened to the guy a couple of days ago. And uh, so I wanted to get kind of where his, like, springboard, where he starts from. And so Genesis chapter 1, 14 and 15, um, it says this. It says, Then God said, Let there be light in the firmament of the heavens to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs. And so this is where they, these two words, signs and seasons, and for days and years, and let them be for lights in the firmament of the heavens to give light on the earth, and it was so. And so what they do is they take this word, this signs, uh, referencing the sun and the moon and the, and, the, and, the, and the light that's in the firmament, the stars and different types of things, and, and they'll say that this is what these, these blood moons are representing something. They're showing us something. They're a sign from God that judgment's coming or so, something major is happening. It doesn't necessarily have to be judgment, but something major is happening on the earth when we see uh, these things in the sky. You know, Joel chapter 2 and, and verse 31 talks about the sun being turned to blood, the, 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 you know, the, the, uh, or, I'm sorry, the moon being turned to blood, the sun um, being affected by certain things as, as that end of that day come. Well, they, they kind of separate those two things and, and they'll talk about the, the blood moon, but they don't talk about the sun. Well, you can't separate them because it, it's, a, it's a sun and this is going on. That's referring to the end times uh, that Jesus was talking about here in Luke 17. He talks a good bit about it in Matthew 24. Um, as well as, as he gives the Olivet Discourse. And so they'll use this verse in Genesis um, as something uh, to look towards these blood moons um, as a sign. So uh, what I want to look at just briefly is the Shemitah, the Shemitah and the blood moons. And so the Shemitah simply is, it means sabbatical or it means Sabbath. And the Jews were, uh, were told to observe that on the seventh year of these cycles they counted in seven years, that they would give the land rest, they'd give people rest, and God would bless them on the sixth year and, and, and basically get them through that seventh year when they were obedient to that command. And so the end of the Shemitah year uh, for the Jews was September the 13th. And some folks said that the rapture was going to happen on September the 13th. So we're either non-believers or the rapture did not happen on September 13th. Um, so that was the end of it. Um, it's, it's the Jewish cal calendar. It's called Elul 29. It would be like, say, in June or May or September. But in the Jewish calendar, it's, it's uh, the, the month of Elul, the, day of 20, the 29th day of Elul. Um, would fall on September the 13th. And, and so something was to happen that day. I, I, I don't know what happened. I kind of went through it and forgot about it. But um, there, the, now there is an interesting connection between um, the end of the Shemitah year 
and certain dates. And they're not wrong in saying these things because these things indeed did happen. So there have been times in history that on Elul 29, at the end of the Shemitah year, um, and I'm just going to show you just a couple things that have happened, and most of these things uh, we're familiar with because we, they were just a number of years ago, but September the 17th, 2001, which was Elul 29, um, if you remember how many days past a significant event happened in America, 9-11. So September the 11th, we know the, uh, the, the attacks that happened on D.C. and, and down in Pen on the Pentagon, I'm sorry, the Pentagon and up in New York and the, the towers. Um, but they say that was, and it was the greatest one-day stock market crash uh, in America. The, you know, the stock market fell 684 points. Um, and then seven years later, I'm sorry, yeah, seven years later, September 29, 2008, Alul 29, the same date, uh, the Dow fell 777 points. And that still is a record to the day for a one-day fall in the stock market. And that's, um, if you're following all that, that's when the, the stock market kind of fell and, and the housing bubble busted and we went into the Great Recession or whatever. And so they, they point to those, and those things did um, indeed happen. And so the current sh uh, Shemitah year uh, began September of 2014 and it ended September 13th here just a couple um, weeks ago. So there is some kind of connection with that, obviously, and, and I don't want to take away from that what they're talking about. Um, I think they're being a little bit, uh, you know, dogmatic about, you know, saying something's going to happen um, here pretty soon. But, um, and so then the blood moons, and like, like I said, I want to get into some scripture and show you guys what the Bible has to say about these things. But the blood moons come in cycles, usually of four moons. Um, and so the current ones, and I'm just going to kind of read them off, um, and the, the times when they happened, the first blood moon uh, showed itself April 15, 2014, on Passover. So they do, they do coincide with Jewish holidays, with the festivals uh, there for the Jews. So the first blood moon appeared April 15, and then these indeed happened, did it happen. The, uh, the second one happened October the 8th, 2014, uh, during the Feast of Tabernacle. Uh, the third blood moon happened April 4th, 2015. Um, and then the last one, um, which is going to happen tonight. So if you want to see a really cool um, thing in the sky, it's going to happen September 28th, uh, 27th into the 28th, uh, 2015, which is the Feast of Tabernacles. It's that last feast. It's the Feast of Booths where the Jews celebrate uh, what God did for them, where they've been commanded to celebrate what God did for them as coming out of Egypt. So they kind of get into booths, and it's, it's kind of like showing, uh, you know, as the Israelites went through the, the wilderness, how God provided for them. So they're commemorating that. They're thinking back on what God's, what God's did. But so the last blood moon, which they're calling a super moon, um, is going to happen tonight. So um, I wrote down some of the times. This is from NASA's uh, web, web page or whatever. But NASA says that um, at 8.11 p.m. tonight, uh, the shadow is going to begin on the blood moon. And then at 10.11 at, at 10, p.m., the eclipse is going to happen. So there's this, there's a lunar eclipse and the super moon are coming together for this big event tonight at 10:11, and then at 10:47 will be the peak of the blood moon. So if you're up at 11, almost 11 o'clock, um, if you've got to work tomorrow, you're probably going to miss it. I think nothing's crazy going to happen, but um, but at 10:47 p.m. tonight, it's going to be the peak. That's when it's going to be at its brightest. So the blood moon will happen um, tonight. So these are the dates that these people that are I call them date setters have set for the month of September. Um, is September the 13th, which is the, the end of the Shemitah year, nothing happened. Um, September 23rd, which was uh, Yom Kippur, the Day of, uh, of Atonement, the, you know, the highest um, holy day in Israel, nothing happened. And then September 28th, obviously, is tomorrow, but it's tonight. Remember, if you remember, the Jews celebrate from evening to evening, so, um, you know, there is something that's going to happen tonight. Um, if you guys are note-takers, Leviticus chapter 23, uh, verses 33 through 42, Leviticus 23, 33 through 42, and then Zechariah 14, uh, verses 16 through 19, speak of this festival that was given to, um, to the Jews to um, celebrate. So with all this being said, this is what Jesus says. Matthew 24 and 36, he says this. But of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Is it, I mean, is that crystal clear? I mean, is that pretty clear to everybody? Yeah. Nobody knows the day or the hour, but my father only. So I'm not real sure what folks do with, with that verse, um, but no one knows the day or the hour. So what I'm going to do real quickly now is read to you guys, and I've seen, a, I've read a lot of articles, I've printed off a lot of articles, read a lot of things. Um, you know, I try to study just so I could be in the know a little bit. Um, and this is the one I think that for me that I think is pretty balanced it says some things that are factual that I've, you know, investigated myself to find to be factual. But, so I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I just want to look, read some highlights um, from this uh, ministry that kind of is following stuff and, and um, 
you know, like I said, they're, they're being balanced with what they say. And, and so this is some of the headlines that are out there in reference to this, these blood moons, the last one happening tonight, uh, about the Shemitah year and you know, different types of things, the harbingers, these judgments that supposedly are coming, that some say. But uh, this is the headline uh, for this article. It says, you know, is a great shaking coming to America? An amazing convergence of events is going to take place during the last several weeks of September. So the author goes on and talks about some things. And what he does, he lists some events that have already happened and will happen, um, I believe. And, and there, there, there are things that, that the gov our government's doing that, which are happening um, and some things with the Jewish holidays that, that are indeed going to happen. So I'm going to list, and there's a, it's a pretty long list, but I've narrowed it down to just, um, looks like eight things I want to just talk about real quick and just read down through to show you the things that indeed are going to happen. Like I said, some of them already happened. So the author gives this list of these events. Um, he says it all starts with the end of the Shemitah year on September the 13th. And then, like he, then he lists out the things that I've already told you about when, when you connect 2001 and 2008 um, back to that. They did indeed land on, on this year, so um, that's where they kind of start from. Um, and then the next one that he talks about and, and is this, September the 14th, which is Rosh Hashanah, Jewish holiday. That indeed happened. He doesn't really connect anything with that. But what he's doing is he's detailing things at the, at the end of this month that, will, that are happening or will happen. Um, and then, then, then at the end, you know, he's just kind of saying this is what people are, were talking about that could possibly happen. September the 15th, I don't know if you guys have followed this. I've looked at it a little bit just because of my military background. But uh, the Jade Helm military exercises that are happening out on the West Coast, some claim uh, that is our government, um, you know, doing urban warfare style of training in preparation for something that they maybe foresee or think is coming or whatever. So that those indeed have happened. They're called Jade Helm exercises. Um, they end at the month of September. Um, September the 15th um, is when the 70th session of the UN General Assembly begins on this date. Um, I, I'm reading this, so I apologize for that. It has been widely reported that France plans to introduce a resolution uh, with the UN um, in reference to recognizing the Palestinian state as an actual state um, that's recognized by the United Nations, just like Israel, United States, or whomever, um, you know. And what they're trying to do is they're trying to take some of the land from Israel. And the Bible is very crystal clear about dividing, the, you know, God's land, that God has something to say about that. And so that's happening. It's already happened, that resolution, those things that, uh, that, uh, that uh, France and some other countries are presenting uh, to the UN. The next one on the list that I've, I've kind of chosen is September the 23rd, which was Yom Kippur. A high holiday there in Jew, the highest holiday really in, in Israel. September the 23rd, um, some people, um, you know, people love to connect the Catholic Church with a lot of things, and so I'm just going to read what they say. And, and, uh, but September 23rd, Pope Francis, as we know, if we've been following the news, arrived at the White House to meet Barack Obama. Some of us just suggested that the timing of this event is highly unusual, and they really don't give any other evidence other than that. Um, and, they, and they all say, you know, the, uh, Pope Francis is the 266th Pope you know, in the succession of popes, who will be meeting uh, with President Obama on the 266th day of the year, leading one to, I mean, so you see all the, you know, you know Bill Clinton is, is the Antichrist, you know, they, they come up with all these, like, numbers, and they try to figure stuff out, and, you know, they come and go, it's just crazy, but, so leading one, one internet preacher, which I think he's referring to this Mark Biltz, um, to speculate uh, that, um, you know, that the 266th day in a typical human body is the gestation period of, of you know, birth, you know, a child. And so from that, something's going to be birthed. I mean, I mean, can you see where people can take something and go with it? But the, but the sad and I think scary thing is sometimes is that some folks will, they dive into this stuff. They read this stuff. Like, you know, is there any truth to this? And I'm not saying that there is or isn't. I'm just, I just read it and just whatever, tuck it away. The next one I have here is September the 25th to the 27th. It says the United Nations is going to launch a brand new sustainable development agenda, which is called the 2030 Agenda. Um, and then... Below, I'm just going to read a couple things what that agenda entails, and they indeed are having uh, this meeting at the UN. Uh, but the 20 agenda is, a tr is, is truly a template for governing the entire planet. Um, they're going to be listing things such as economics, health, energy, education, agriculture, gen gender equality, and a whole host of other issues. Um, and so um, what, what, they, what they're trying to push at this UN meeting from um, uh, September 25th to the 27th which is kind of at the end of that now, is, is some, what they're calling like the new world order, where the, where the govern, where the govern, one, there's like a one world universal type of a thing, an agenda that they're trying to push. You know, if you understand Bible prophecy, obviously that's, I spoke about in Revelation chapter 13, but um, that's what they're talking about. So the author kind of includes that as something important, important happening in the month of September. And the last and important one is September the 28th, which is tomorrow, starting today. Um, the author says, this is a date when the Feast of Tabernacles 
begins. It is also the date that the last of the four blood moons are, is going to be visible, um, like, I, like I've already told you guys, roughly around 10 minutes to 11 um, tonight. And so what these preachers and what these people are talking about, um, the, uh, Jonathan Carr and the other ones, Mark Bil Biltz out there, is that they are claiming, they're connecting the, the Feast of Tabernacles with the rapture of the church. So the rapture of the church is going to start sometime, it's going to occur supposedly sometime tonight, they're claiming. Um, I'm still planning my day tomorrow, um, so I'm not real, you know, sure that's, you know, whatever. I'm not, I don't, and I don't mean to make fun. I just think it's nonsense when people start making these date settings. Um, they also uh, make reference to uh, this time being, uh, you know, so as, the, as so they make this illustration between the Jews, they leave their homes, um, they build these tabernacles, or they build these, these temporary dwellings to recognize what God did in Egypt as a way to show you that God's going to remove his church into our new dwelling, you know, John 14, you know, where Jesus says, I've gone, I've gone and prepared a place for you to create a man. So we, we go away, and then the tribulation period starts, and that's detailed in Revelation chapter 6 through 19. Uh, but, so that's what they're saying is happening. And so here's the end re uh, uh, part of this article which I can't, agree, I, I can't agree with a little bit. I can understand what he's saying. But, uh, so this, the author says, many have asked Jonathan Kahn whether America is headed for revival or a shaking. He is convinced that revival can come out of a shaking. Personally, I believe that we will not have revival unless there um, is a shaking. So I can kind of agree with that. You know, God sometimes allows those kind of things to happen to wake us up, I think to wake the church up but also to wake people up to the knowledge of who Christ is. And so with all this in mind, what I want to do real quick this morning is just go through some Bible verses um, to, to show us what our response to these kind of things are. You know, there's some people that I've talked to about the blood moons, about the Shemitah, about all these th things that these people are trying to connect dots and claiming something's going to happen on this day or that day. And, you know, there's all this stuff going on behind the scenes, uh, you know, bringing in this, this one world government, which it very well could be, but... Um, but what is the response for the church? Because what I'm finding as I'm talking to Christians is that when they begin to read these things, it paralyzes them. They become fearful. I mean, is that what we're, I mean, is the church to be fearful? I mean, do we, do we not have hope in Christ? You know, and so what's happening is it's like the, you know, it's like the, uh, what is the guy down at Waco, Texas? You know, people start building compounds, and they go to the mountain, they sell everything. It just gets to be nonsense. You know, their, their focus becomes only on this alone, and, we, and they forget about what the scriptures clearly teach us uh, that our response um, is to these things and then how we're to be living our lives and the things that we are to be doing. So I'm going to start with Colossians chapter 2, verses 16 through 17. Uh, this guy named Mark um, Biltz. Um, like I said, he's one of the main voices out there. He's a, a Messianic rabbi. Um, you know, he, he points a lot back to these festivals, connects a lot to the festivals. Um, but he, he does it to the point where um, it's the same thing that the writer of Hebrews, when he was addressing the Christians, it's the same thing when the, uh, Paul, uh, to the churches in Galatia, was addressing the Christians back in the first century, where the Jews were coming in and saying, that's fine, you can follow Christ, you could be in Jesus, but you still got to be circumcised, and you still got to celebrate this, and you got to do that. And so this guy, this Mark Biltz, is saying the same thing. And so he made a comment that I read and, and talked in the back of my mind, but he said, um, he said, if the Lord is to tarry, if the Lord is to delay his come, he says, my hope is that, and so I was talking to, to uh, my wife about this, but he says, my hope is to, now, I would finish that sentence by, you know, kind of echoing 2 Peter 3, you know, that the Lord is long-suffering, not wanting any to perish. So I would finish that sentence and say, you know, if the Lord is to tarry, then I want to be involved in sharing Christ. I want to be involved in discipleship. I want to be involved in what the church has been called to do. But what he says is, if the Lord is to tarry, then it's going to give us time to celebrate the festivals, to be engaged in the Jewish festivals. I'm like... It doesn't make no sense. The Bible doesn't teach that, that we're to be engaged in these things. That's the reason why Paul wrote to a lot of these churches, because they were being um, harassed by what they referred to as Judaizers that were coming in and saying, yeah, Jesus plus the old way. And Paul says it can't be like that. But in Colossians chapter 2, 16 to 17, Paul addresses this issue. He says, don't, so don't let anyone condemn you for what you eat or drink or, or, or for, uh, for not celebrating certain holy days, these, these days that, he's refer that I'm talking about, or new moon ceremonies or Sabbaths, for well, these rules are only shadows of the reality yet to come, and Christ himself is the reality. So what Paul is saying is when you're in Christ, you're keeping all the commands, you're keeping all the festivals, you're doing everything, because all those festivals are a foreshadowing pointing to Jesus Christ. And then Jesus came, you know, obviously to fulfill those things. And so um, I just kind of want to go rapidly down through a couple things here. 
and show you what our response is then uh, to this and, and for us to have this confidence and this assurance no matter what happens when you're abiding in Christ. We've been talking about that as our, we've gone through our study in 1 John, um, you know, what, our, uh, what we should be doing. So Hebrews chapter 10, and I've talked about this verse a good bit as we've, uh, as we've gone through uh, 1 John, but Hebrews chapter 10, 23 and 25, the writer there is clear on, on what we should be doing as we, as we see the day approaching, this, this time of Christ's return approaching. Uh, in verse 23 it says, Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he, is prom- for he who is promised is faithful. And let us consider one another. So he's going to list a couple things that we should be doing in the church in order to stir up love and good works not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, that's meeting like we are right now, as in the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. So that's the New King James, the King James Version will say, as you see the day approaching. Now I included on the slide here uh, the New Living Translation, because I think this is what it means. Uh, the New Living Translation uh, uh, translates or gives us kind of the paraphrased version of that last portion of Hebrews uh, 10.25. It says, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return, Christ's return, is drawing and so that's what I believe that uh, means. You'll see the capitalization of, of day in the New King James or the King James Bible. Um, you know, we're not told, and th- that day can only mean two things. It's either the return of Christ or it's the tribulation period. It's like the day of the Lord. There's nowhere in the Bible that I know that we're told to look towards the tribulation, that we're to focus on that and try to figure that out. But the Bible is clear on us looking toward Christ. Our goal is Christ. We're looking to Jesus. We're, wanting, we're, we're looking at his return. And so that's what I believe uh, the writer says there. And so the writer of Hebrews then tells us there are certain things that should be going on in our lives. Um, that is holding fast there in verse 23 to, to, to the gospel message that saved us and to, and to that. And um, concerning one another, stirring up love and good works, you know, assembling together, exhorting one another, encouraging one another in the work um, of the Lord. And then I've included 1 John chapter 2, and we just looked at this last Sunday, but I wanted to include it again because there's so much truth in there and so much encouragement, I believe, that's in, the, in these verses. But 1 John 2, 28 and 29 and then chapter 3, verses 2 and 3. And like I said, we looked at this last Sunday, but John says there, And now little children abide in him, that when he appears, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of him. And then chapter 3 and 2 says, Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Um, and everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just um, as he is pure. And so, John, and like I said, we talked about it last Sunday, but it's so important to understand that, you know, when we're abiding in Christ, why should we stress up about what blood moon happens tonight? Why should we be worried about what, you know, the Shemitah represents? I mean, obviously, there's, there might be some truth in some of this th- stuff, but our focus uh, needs to be on, in abiding in Christ, practicing righteousness, and pur- purifying ourselves or living pure lives and there the example is Christ, just as he is pure, living uh, that uh, well-pleasing life, um, you know, before the Lord. And so I want to dive into First Thessalonians and then Second Thessalonians, and then kind of try to bring the whole thing to a close, because when Paul wrote to the church in Thessalonica, the same uh, type of folks that were harassing the church there in the first century where John is writing here, First John, come against these false teachers, these people that were coming in with some level of influence, trying to teach something that was contrary to what um, Paul taught them, um, in Acts chapter 17, where the church in Thessalonica was birthed uh, in three weeks. Um, and so he left the healthy church when he moved on from Thessalonica. And so he catches wind that some people had, had, had kind of crept in and began to teach certain things. And if you understand the, the letter uh, to the uh, church in Thessalonica, 1 Thessalonians, um, there's a lot of things that he says in there, but, but one of the main points that he talks about in 1 Thessalonians is the rapture of the church. Who's all heard of the rapture of the church? Show of hands. Who all believes in the rapture of the church? That, that, it may not be everybody. Um, some, you know, there's still debate about that, but I like, the ho- I like that hope of the rapture of the church. I think that the Bible for me kind of lays that out. But, and so he teaches them that in 1 Thessalonians. And what was happening was some false teachers had crept into the church, and they were teaching the, the, the church there in Thessalonica, those Christians, that the rapture already occurred. And so what Paul is doing is addressing that issue when he writes to them about the rapture. And most of us, if, you're, you know, if you understand the rapture and the and the, and the stuff behind it. Um, and like I said, I picked this, or I picked this apart a little bit, uh, jumped down through verses, and not looking at the main points of the rapture, the idea of being caught up. Um, it's not included in this, but that's where uh, that word rapture comes from, from the Latin Vulgate. Um, and you'll know that if you attend uh, Stephen's Bible class after this upstairs. We've been ta- we talked about the Latin Vulgate last Sunday, but just a little advertisement for you, Stephen. Um, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, 
Um, and like I said, I'm going to jump through this, jumping through verses to show you, um, um, you know, what Paul has to say about the rapture, about the encouragement we need to have as we see these things uh, taking place. So Paul says, but concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need uh, that I should write to you. So the emphasis that Paul's making here to this church is they, they should already know. I'm just kind of re-emphasizing something I've already taught you guys. Why are you allowing these guys to, to harass you, to bring in different teachings, things I've taught, that I've taught you, they're claiming isn't true. And he says, don't do that. You already know these things. Verse 2, for you yourselves know perfectly that, perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. Verse 4, but you, brethren, are not in darkness, so that this day should overtake you as a thief. You are all sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. So he's comparing uh, us as sons of the light to the sons of that of a darkness. Those are non-believers that, that we know have a certain level of things. We've studied this in 1 John. You know, we have the anointing that we might know all things we've talked about. Verse 6, therefore let us not sleep. The idea is being kind of slumbering, you know, uh, you know, not checking these things out, not being on guard. So let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. Verse 9, for God did not appoint us to wrath. Is that not good news? God, I mean, it's just like no one knows the day or hour, pretty clear. God did not appoint us to wrath, pretty clear. You know, that's the encouragement that the scriptures give us. God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. And then verse 11, therefore, because of these things, comfort each other and edify one another uh, just as you are um, doing. You know, if the church is to go through this tribulation period, the church is to experience these kind of things, what comfort can I give you guys? What comfort can you give me in thinking that that stuff's going to happen to us? Because if you understand the nature of the tribulation, you know, it's God pouring wrath out on, on, on this earth that has kind of uh, sh has shaken their fist at God, you know, thumbed their noses at God. I mean, I don't want to be a part of that. It's a horrible time. Jesus says the worst time that's ever going to happen on, on the face of the planet for all, all, for all uh, history's sake. Horrible time. But we're, Paul tells us here we're to comfort one another with these words, knowing that, that we're not going to experience this. Now, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. I just kind of quickly want to go down through this. So, the, so these guys never went away. They stayed there in the area. They kept harassing, kept bothering. So Paul felt it necessary to write a second letter to them. And now 2 Thessalonians, when you study that, if you understand that, there's things that obviously Paul says other than the main, well, I think what do I consider to be the main topic, but he addresses the tribulation period. And he, he addresses uh, the second coming of Christ a little bit differently uh, than he did in 1 Thessalonians, where I believe he, he addresses the rapture of the church in 1 Thessalonians more specifically than he does here in 2 Thessalonians. But in 2 Thessalonians 2, um, starting in verse 1, it says this, Now, dear brothers and sis sisters, let us clarify some things about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and how we will be gathered to meet him. Don't be so easily shaken or alarmed by these folks that were coming in and doing that, by those who say that the, the day of the Lord has already begun. Don't believe them. Even if they claim to have a spiritual vision, which some of these guys are claiming out there today, and a revelation and they're doing the same thing, or a letter supposedly from us, don't be fooled by what they say, for that day will not come until there is a great rebellion against God and the man of lawlessness is revealed, referring to the Antichrist there, the one who brings destruction. Verse 15, with all these things in mind, dear brothers and sisters, stand firm and keep a strong grip on the teaching we passed on to you. That's right here for us today, the scriptures, um, both in person and by letter. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and our God, and God our Father who loved us, and by his grace gave, give, uh, gave us eternal comfort and a wonderful hope, um, comforts you and strengthen you in every good thing that you do and say. And so the, the end thing that I, look, you know, I want to look at there is that verse 16. You know, Christ, if you're abiding in the Lord Jesus, he's the one that brings comfort. He's the one that brings us this hope. In light of all these things that uh, Paul is, is writing to the church there in Thessalonica about this, you know, don't be shaken, don't be alarmed, don't believe people that are saying some of these things. And I'm not going to try to rule off everything that's being said out there, um, there could be some truth in some of it. But don't be so fooled by all the stuff. Don't be tossed to and fro is the idea we've looked at in Ephesians chapter 4, um, you know, where, where that instruction is given to us as we study the scriptures. But, and then the last thing, and then I'm going to close with this, uh, because Peter's pretty, he's pretty, um, you know, as I was reading through this, it was pretty, like, sobering for me, um, because this, these things are going to happen, and there is destruction coming one day to the earth. The scripture's very clear on that. But Second Peter chapter 3 Starting in verse 10, Peter tells us this, but the day of the Lord will come, so it's definitely going to come, as unexpectedly as a thief. Then the heavens will pass away with a terrible noise, and the uh, very elements themselves will disappear in fire, and the earth and everything on it will be found to deserve judgment. Since everything around us is going to be destroyed like this, 
what? And so here's the answer to that question that, you know, that I've asked. You know, how should we be living? What should we be doing? What holy and godly lives you should live, looking forward to the day of God. 14 says, and so, dear friends, while you are waiting for these things to happen, make every effort to be found living peaceful lives that are pure and blameless in his sight. So he gives us some other things that as, that as followers of Christ or something that's abiding in Jesus, what should be seen in our lives. Living pure lives, blameless lives, living in peace with one another. 17 says, I am warning you ahead of time, dear friends, be on guard. Same thing that Paul was addressing to, first, to the churches in First and Second Thessalonians, to that church. Be on guard so that you will not be carried away by the errors of, those, of these wicked people. And he's referring back to people that were trying to, uh, to twist the scriptures around to make them sound, what, you know, sound like what they wanted them to say. But for these wicked people and lose your own secure footing, rather you must grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. All glory to him, both now and forever. Amen. So the, the end instruction that Peter gives in his last letter, when he closes that letter out, is for us to grow in the grace of and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. See, when you're growing in the knowledge of Christ, when you're abiding with Jesus, the things that are, are, are happening out there, the, the, noise, the noise of people, you know, the blood moons is going to do this, the rapture is going to occur sometime tonight, the tribulation's starting tomorrow, this is that, the 13th, you know, is the rapture's going to, you know, all this stuff gets the church, like I said, kind of paralyzed. We don't want to do things. We, want, we don't want to be engaged in what Christ has asked us to do, and that is to do, um, you know, to do these things that, I, that I've kind of... Um, Caleb, if you want to put that last one up there, I'm just going to close with this real quick. And I'm not going to talk about this. I just put it up if you guys want to take notes, because what I want you guys to do is I want you to go into Matthew chapters 24 and 25 in the course of this next week, um, and that's where Jesus gives the Olivet Discourse where he talks about the end times. The disciples ask him about these things, and so he lays out some things. But what is, our, what, what is our response to the fact these things are going to indeed happen one day? And so what I've done there um, in those four things, I've included the chapter and verses. Um, there are parables that Jesus taught about certain things. And what you're going to find, and so look for the words, and I've included some of the words there. Watch, be ready, faithfulness, fine, uh, fine doing is a statement. Being wise in, in comparison to being <laughs> foolish. Gained or made more talents. And so look through those sections. And find those words, find the instruction that Christ gives us about how we're to be living in light of the fact that the tribulation period indeed is coming one day. There's a time coming to the earth that's going to be crazy. But as followers of him, we're not to be caught, you know, with like these, the wind of doctrine, all these extra things that people are trying to add to the scriptures or claiming this is going to happen or that's going to happen and getting everybody shook up. But look what Jesus says our response of these things should be. And it's always going to be watching and being ready and doing the work of the Lord. So with that being said, I ran a little late, sorry. Um, do that homework. I, I, I mean, I, I spent some time going down through that, and, there, and it's really encouraging in light of some of the noise that's going on out there. If anybody's got any other questions or comments or something afterwards, well, you can talk to me about it. Um, there's some other stuff I know about the, uh, the blood moons and the Shemitah and all that, but um, so I would encourage you guys uh, to do your homework and not get shaken so much by some of the things um, that are out there. Next Sunday, we're going to continue our study, First John 3, starting uh, in verse 4, so if you guys want to read ahead. Uh, the Praise and Worship Band can come up, and we can sing songs Sing a song uh, to the one that gives us great hope. Let's pray, Father. Lord, we thank you that your word is, is, is a word of comfort, that your word is a word of instruction, Lord, that your word is, um, Lord, it's a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path. Lord, it guides and instructs me. Lord, it keeps me on the right path. Lord, it, um, it gives me encouragement, Lord, as, as Paul has said, that we can encourage one another, that we can exhort one another, we can bring words of comfort, Lord, as we see things, Lord, that you are orchestrating, that you're putting in place, that you're doing, Lord, knowing that our time with you one day is, is rapidly approaching. Lord, I pray that each one of us would be found uh, being watchful, being uh, guarding the things, Lord, that, that we know to be true about you. Lord, that we're, we're doing the work that you've asked us to do, Lord, that we're increasing uh, the talents, Lord, that you've given us, Lord, and we know that's by the work of your Spirit in our lives, Lord, as we abide in our relationship with you, Jesus. Lord, I pray that, uh, that we'd walk out here this morning uh, with great confidence, Lord, knowing that um, everything is okay when we're in you. So I give these things over to you, Lord, I ask you to minister to us and speak to our hearts and ask it in Jesus' name.